Okay, let's get started. Uh, as always, I will offer up a few uh, tips and tricks on PyroSim. Um, but before I start speaking, any other questions? Anything about PyroSim that I can help with today? I have one question. Yes. Yes. It, that's a good question. So should you normalize your fitness to be between 0 and 1? And the answer is it doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter is because if you think about your evolutionary algorithm, the only thing that matters is relative fitness, right? Individuals survive if they have higher or lower fitness, depending if you're counting down or counting, counting up. So there's no need to normalize the entire range of, of fitness values. It doesn't matter. Any other questions? Okay, one other aspect of PyroSim um, that we haven't talked about too much is uh, collisions. So I wanted to just point you to part of the PyroSim documentation that might be useful. And this is particularly useful for those of you that have robots that are interacting with other objects in the environment. For example, the pendulum simulation you see here. And I'm going to just talk through the collisions in this simulation and how they're dealt with. So inside of PyroSim, there's a concept. We're going to skip over this idea of collision matrix and focus more on collision groups. And you can find this in the uh, getting started section of the documentation. OK, so as the documentation says here, collision group is a collection of bodies, a collection of bodies or objects which all collide with each other or all don't collide with each other. So you can define when you're creating objects, you can assign them to a collision group. And after they've been assigned to a collision group, you're going to tell PyroSim how to deal with all the objects in that group. All the objects are allowed to collide and interpenetrate with one another or not. They should. If they come in contact with one another, forces are going to be applied to push in the opposite uh, direction. OK. You can, you can assign objects to multiple groups. For example, as you see down here in this example, there are two groups, the robot group and the environment group. So in the pendulum simulation that I just showed you, all of the objects that make up the robot are assigned to the robot collision group. And all of the objects that belong to the environment are assigned to the environment group. Once you've done that, you then tell PyroSim how to deal with collisions between, within that, that group and between that group. Okay, so how does that work? There's a little, this visualization here is to help you figure out how to do this. You can think of it as a graph, if you like, where every node in the graph corresponds to a collision group. So inside this node, are all the objects that make up the robot, and inside this node are all the objects out there in the environment. Okay. If you assign, for example, an edge between these two nodes, you're indicating that an object from the robot and an object from the environment, if they come into contact with one another, they should not interpenetrate. They should be pushed in the opposite direction. In this case, none. There are no collision uh, detection and Detections and resolution. Okay. That's none. That's inter. What does intra mean? Things within a group can't collide. Exactly. Things within a group cannot collide, but any pair of objects from robot and environment can. And all is respect all collisions. Okay. So in the pendulum, in the pendulum simulation. How are the objects dealt with? What is the collision group and what is the relationship between collision groups in this simulation? So there's a pendulum that the robot can collide with the environment and the environment can collide with itself. The environment, objects in the environment can collide with themselves and obviously objects that make up the robot can collide with objects that make up the environment. And if you watch the pendulum carefully, you will notice that objects that make up the pendulum sometimes interpenetrate, and there is no collision resolution in that case. Can you have intercollision with a robot without it, with it working with joints? Does that work at all? Uh, usually not. Okay. Yes? Instead of there's a, there's a joint, it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't deal, deal with a collision. If there's, there's a line up there, but it's shorter. Like <laughs> Thank you. If 
if there's regardless of how there's certain parties there, but this would choose objects that are connected to it. Uh, that's right, right? So if, if objects are connected by a joint, they by definition are not respected. But you could have an object that's connected to another object by a joint. There's a yeah. second joint attached to a third object. Those two can collide. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, good question. OK, so you can go and have a look at the code for the pendulum at your leisure. I just will walk you through this very quickly. Here's the construction of, uh, here's the collection, uh, the connection, uh, sorry, the construction of the pendulum. And you'll notice in the construction of the pendulum, when the objects are put in there, we're assigning each object to the robot collision group. Here's all the joints making up the pendulum. Then we get to the environment. And here's the environment being built up as a series of boxes. And we're assigning each box to the collision group called environment. And then once we've done that, we get back an ID associated with the collision group robot and an ID associated with the collision group environment. And then down here, we can assign collisions to those groups. So there's us adding an edge between ro the robot and environment collision group, indicating that any <clears throat> collisions between robot objects and environment objects should be respected. And any intra-collisions within the environment collision group should also be respected. Make sense? OK. Go and have a look at that if that's relevant to your uh, project. Um, there was another question about robots falling over. So if you're dealing with the biped, or some other robot that's dynamically unstable, it's possible that it falls over. Uh, there are different ways that you can include in your fitness function a term that selects for stability or staying upright. One of the simplest ways to do this is to add a conditional when you compute your fitness function. So if the robot falls over below some height, it gets a fitness of zero. So let's imagine you have your fitness function for your walking robot. You assign the fitness for a given robot, and after that, you have some conditional that says if the position of the Z component of the head, for example, you might put a position sensor in the head. If at any point that Z coordinate falls below some threshold, then just set the fitness equal to zero. So regardless of what fitness it picked up here, you can add a conditional and say, if there was some condition that the robot violated, fitness equals zero. So again, if you're dealing with bipeds or dynamically unstable robots, that might be falling over. Depending on what you're doing, it might be something else. If it's the ball-throwing robot, if the robot drops the ball, maybe it gets an F of zero and so on. So obviously, you can combine algebraic manipulations when you compute your fitness function, but you can also add in conditionals that drop fitness to zero if something bad happens. Okay, that might be useful uh, to some of you. Uh, another thing I saw this week is uh, someone had a robot that was made up of a cylinder which had a very, very small radius. You might remember when we talked about collisions all the way back at the beginning of the semester. Um, physics engines tend to have a hard time with very, very small objects or very, very thin objects. Because when collisions are detected, it's estimating the positions on the surface of the objects. And if the surface is very small relative to the volume, it's possible for one object to actually pass through or deeply embed itself within another object before that collision is detected. And when that situation happens, usually physics engines can't handle that situation very well. So if you have an unstable or exploding robot, first thing to do is go and have a look and see if you have any small objects or exceedingly thin objects uh, and rectify that and you should have a better, more stable simulation. Okay, I think that's all I had to say about Pyrosim today. Any other questions? Okay, so back to lecture. Uh, where are we and where we're going? Where are we going? Um, I've added this new lecture. Uh, this year called Morphological protect Protection, and this will be our last lecture in this theme on evolving bodies uh, and brains. Next week, we have a collection of miscellaneous topics. So some of these, again, are very, very new ideas, um, sort of a series of shorter concepts that we're going to introduce. Uh, on Tuesday, another one of my PhD students, Anton Bernatsky, will be here, and he will be telling you about some of his research that connects evolving bodies and brains with modularity, uh, two topics that we've talked about. 
And next Thursday, I'll finish things off with a pair of lectures on two uh, brand new uh, papers that came out this year. Um, we're going to end with this one, which is arguably the first demonstration of a robot making a robot, where the first robot is a 3D printer, and the 3D printer prints a 1D robot. Okay, we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, then that's it for the semester until our exam period on May 10th when you'll be presenting your final project orally. Um, a couple of you asked, that about, asked me about that this week, so I figure we'll just spend a few minutes now talking about expectations for the written and oral presentation. Okay, if you click on this link here, it will take you back to the same final project document you've been working off of for your weekly reports. You're all done with your weekly reports, re weekly deliverables. So if you scroll down, there is a second section on uh, the written report and then a third and final section on the oral presentation. Okay, let's just very briefly go through this. In the written report, it is due at 11.59 p.m. the night before the final exam uh, period. It's gonna be 0% if it's late because the TA and I have to start grading things immediately on the 10th, so no late penalties for the written report. Um, you'll be submitting a PDF document um, into the final project uh, folder. There'll be a written report assignment there for you, and you're posting one PDF document. Make sure it's PDF, 0% if other formats. Um, four pages, about double space, 12 point font, just to give you an idea for length. There's the percent grade for the grad students and undergraduates. What are we looking for in the written report? Um, we're looking for four different things. You should budget about a page for each, um, just roughly. Okay. First section is what were your goals? What were you trying to evolve your robot to do? Um, how did your deliverables move you towards that goal? What changes did you have to make to your weekly deliverables as you went? As I mentioned before, we're not expecting that whatever you mentioned, whatever you decided to do three weeks ago is this the same thing you're doing now, as long as you give us a justification for why you've changed the direction you were, you were heading in. Okay, uh, second section is implementation details, or what would be known as the methods section in an actual paper, right? This is the how. What, what did you actually do? What was your robot? What was your environment? What was the fitness function? Uh, and so on. Third section is results. So you're going to have to describe to us your results verbally, and then we're also looking for a figure. An obvious choice would be fitness curves, which we talked about uh, last time. You've seen lots of visualizations in this class now that try and present visually in a static figure what a robot is doing over time. You might go back to the legged locomotion uh, lecture where we talked about the footprint graph, Lots of different things you could, you could do here. Again, what are we looking for? We're looking for in this section for you to prove to us that you were able to evolve something that's beyond what you would get with just a random controller in your robot in the environment. Okay, fourth and final section, you're gonna be demonstrating to us that you've thought about your project. You've learned something about what's easy, what's difficult. Um, a good thing to do in this last section is imagine you had another year to work on this project. How would you continue your project given the lessons you've learned over the last few weeks? How would you expand uh, your projects? What new features might you want from PyroSim in order, in order to implement them? You might sketch out uh, a bunch of fitness functions that you think would select for something better than what you actually got. If you had another year, imagine you have 100 computers or 1,000 computers. You could evolve for much longer with a much larger population. What kinds of things might you, might you do? Okay, so thinking into the future helps us understand that you understand the reality of your project and sort of what works and what doesn't. Okay. On to the oral presentation. Uh, okay, that's not a link. Actually, it is a link. I haven't put together the presentation schedule yet. I will do so. Um, again, you will be submitting a video of your, that you'll be using in your oral presentation at 11.59 p.m. the night before uh, the, light, the night before our final project presentations. Again, 0% if late. You'll be submitting, in this case, a URL that points to a YouTube video. So you're going to be creating a YouTube video with no audio, and then we're going to play that video in, uh, during the exam period, and you're going to come up here and sort of talk over the video. 
Okay, you're not going to be talking for very long. We have uh, 63 presentations to get through in 165 minutes, so that means you all have two minutes and 30 seconds, which will give us a 10 minute break halfway through. It's going to be a bit of a marathon, but you're going to see lots of interesting robots in 165 minutes. Okay, so the video has to be exactly two minutes and 30 seconds. If it's any longer, again, 0%. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, so make sure that your video is exactly that long. Uh, you can use the YouTube video editor, anything else you want, that's perfectly fine. There's the percent, uh, the percent grade. Okay, so like the written report, we're looking for sort of, for you to mention briefly in two minutes and 30 seconds, four different things. Uh, first of all, we're looking for, again, you to communicate or show us a random behavior and an evolved behavior. By watching those two videos, we should be able to understand the majority of what you were doing in your, your final project. Okay. Uh, your video should contain no audio. As I mentioned, you're gonna talk over the video. Um, and in order to keep things on time, once everyone has submitted their YouTube videos at midnight the night before, the TA immediately after that will stitch all 63 videos together into one long playlist. And at 1.30 p.m. on May 10th, we'll press play on the playlist and it will run all the way through for 165 minutes. I'll put up the presentation schedule on the board here so you'll know when you're presenting. When your video comes up, you can stand up, come to the front of the room, start talking, and when you're done, go sit down. When the next video comes up, next student and next student and next student, and we'll get through all 63 videos in 165 minutes. Okay. Unfortunately, if you run long, I'm going to get the hook and pull you off. So make sure that you practice your timing very carefully. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, I mentioned, so like the written report, the oral presentation. So we're looking for results. And results in the oral presentation is probably going to be these two videos, random behavior and evolved behavior. You probably want to say a little bit about methods. What did you do? What couldn't we see from the video? What was the fitness function? What was the evolutionary algorithm that you used? Talk a little bit about what was difficult and what was easy. And fourth one is, your go what were your original goals? What were you trying to do? Did you achieve it? If not, what changes did you have to make along the way? Okay, so goals, methods, results, and then what would you do if you had another year to work on the project? So basically an oral summary of your written report. That's the final project. Sound good? Okay. Two minutes and 30 seconds is really not a lot of time. So practice, practice, practice. Okay, so back to lecture now. Uh, we'll finish lecture 27 here on why evolve bodies. Just as a reminder, in lectures 25 and 26, we looked at two different hows, two different ways to evolve morphology and control. And we're focusing on lecture 27 here on an experiment I conducted a few years back to try and answer the question of why would you want to do so? Okay, just as a reminder, um, there are many reasons why you might want to do so, but uh, the main one, or not the main one, but one of them is that we can actually build in multiple timescales. So we can have the bodies of robots changing over phylogenetic or evolutionary time. And we can have bodies changing over ontogenetic or developmental time, right? So for each individual species, if you like, it has its own developmental trajectory. In nature, your DNA is setting that developmental trajectory. In the experiment we looked at on Tuesday, we were manually telling evolution what the trajectory was and when to change to the next developmental trajectory because we wanted to see what would happen if we were evolving robots in which bodies changed over phylogenetic time and changed over ontogenetic time. What did we find in that experiment? What happens when you evolve bodies over evolutionary time and ontogenetic time? They get more uh, adaptable because of certain things they didn't do right. They're more adaptive and more robust, right? So they're able to adapt, they're able to continue moving. So we selected for locomotion as you saw last time, or phototaxis. They evolve in certain bodies, and then over evolutionary time, those bodies change until eventually they have to perform phototaxis in the upright-legged robot. 
So this controller you see on the right here is the descendant of the controller you saw on the left. So you have this lineage of evolved controllers that are trying to produce phototaxis in a whole bunch of different bodies. Those bodies are changing over phylogenetic time and ontogenetic time. And a surprising result, at least for us, maybe not in retrospect, but at the time, was now you take this evolved controller from the right and you expose it to external novelty, something it hasn't seen before, which in, that in this case was wind, and it's more robust than controllers that were only ever evolved in the upright legged body. So remember that in robotics in general, we're trying to create robots that are robust. They should be able to do whatever we want them to do as the world around them changes. And one way to do that is to build in Devo. As the bodies of the ro robots or organisms change, the nervous system or the neural network controller uh, for that robot has to similarly adapt to changes in the body. Okay, so that's where we left things last time. So we looked at a whole bunch of these experiments com com looking at different kinds of morphological change. Light gray bars were no morphological change at all. And we ended last time by looking at this black bar here, which is ontogenetic morphological change and phylogenetic morphological change. Not only did it take us fewer robot evaluations to get phototaxis compared to no morphological change, but it also made things more robust. These robots experienced a less percent drop in performance when exposed to wind than controllers that were evolved in the morphologies that never changed. Okay, so this is a nice engineering result. We can design or evolve these robots faster and they're more robust. Okay, so here is the five experiments we looked at last time. If we focus on experiment number three and experiment number five here, you can see that there are, this was a particular way that we changed the developmental trajectory. We went from the infant form to the adult form, the legless, the legless to the legged robot um, gradually. And then as evolution proceeded, we accelerated the infant to the adult form until eventually we throw away the infant form altogether. Okay, that's just one way of doing Devo. Maybe our results were specific to that particular way of doing Devo. Accelerate the change from infant to adult. So what happens if we try something else? So I'll go back and forth between these two. And if you look at experiment three and five, We've changed the way we do Devo. I'm going to show you the results from these four experiments. I didn't redo the fifth one because we don't need to. There's no change there. Which of these four experiments do you think is going to do well? And by well, I mean get the same results we saw before. <laughs> Evolve robots faster and have them be more robust. <laughs> Hopefully we're going to see what we saw before, right? Experiment number four down here and two over here. Okay. Surprise, surprise, that's pretty much what we saw. So green here is experiment number four. And let me back up here. Red is actually number three. Let's not focus on that one for the moment. I think for our purposes, it's good enough to focus on number four here where Despite the fact that we're doing Devo in a different way, we're not accelerating the infant to adult form. We're simply just starting with either the infant or some hybrid form between the infant and adult form, a second hybrid form, and then back to the adult form. It still always, it still does better. The green bar is lower than the light gray bar. So this was just an additional experiment we did to try and show that it actually doesn't matter too much how you do Devo. As long as Devo is in there, as long as development is in there, it tends to help with this process. Okay, same thing for the hexapod. Okay. Last thing I'll, I'll talk about, and we just did this with the quadruped. We kind of ran out of time on this experiment. So we went back and did everything again, but now we evolved with wind. 
So now as the robots were evolving, their external environment was also kind of noisy. We added these small random external perturbations to push the robot around. And now we saw a real improvement in Evo Devo here. So Devo had even more, was even more helpful when the robot was evolving in a noisy environment. Okay. Last thing, um, as roboticists, we wanted to make sure this worked in hardware, that we could cross the reality gap. So we built a physical version of these Evo Devo robots out of state-of-the-art robotic technology. Anybody have this state-of-the-art robot technology at home? The Lego Mindstorms? Okay. It's amazing how far you can push this stuff. Okay. So again, this was just sort of a proof of concept, but to show you how this works. We built a robot that had two motors at the center here, and these two motors have two hinge joints, as you'll see in a moment. One that allows the robot to roll, and another one that, or sorry, this one allows it to roll, and the other one allows it to yaw. So we've got two degrees of freedom. So the neural network controller for our Lego robot here is going to control just these two motors. So that's the fast time scale, sensor motor coordination, to allow the robot to actually move. How do we do Devo? Well, we put a gearing system on the front and the back. So there's a, one motor in the front and a, a third motor in the front and a fourth motor in the back, which allows the robot's morphology to gradually go from the flat robot to the upright robot. So two of the motors in the center are going to be fast time scale, and motors three and four at the front and back of the robot are going to be Devo, the slower time scale. If you put all four together, here you have a robot that's walking, and as it's walking, the morphology is gradually changing. Okay. Again, not necessarily state of the art, but a good proof of concept. You can see this gearing system on the front and the back of the robot is pretty heavy. So after we were able to evolve this controller, we took the gearing system off and got this. In, again, the upright legged form. That's the top view. Here's the side view. All right, if you have Mindstorms at home, you can actually make quadrupedal locomotion. Okay, so just a proof of concept that we could do this in reality. Um, and that concludes our discussion on why evolve morphology. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Okay, so that's lecture 27. Um, we're going to move on to lecture 28 now, which is a relatively new concept called morphological protection. And before we get into the how of morphological protection, let's talk about the why. We saw in lecture 25 and 26 different ways of evolving morphology and control. In 27, we showed if you evolve morphology and control, it can be useful from a robotics point of view. You can design robots faster, and they can be more robust. Turns out, however, that it's exceedingly difficult to evolve morphology and control in the following sense. Most mutations that hit the morphology or the controller of the robot tend to be catastrophic. So whatever fitness was before, fitness drops almost all the way to zero compared with a case where you fix morphology and just evolve the controller. Why do you think that's so? Why are mutations much more dangerous when you're evolving morphology and control compared to just evolving control? Because shortening one leg, for example, is going to completely throw off everything about how you walk. Exactly. So everything, pretty much everything we've seen in this course up to the last section has been fixing the morphology because slight changes to synaptic weights tend to change behavior slightly, but morphological change, like shortening the legs, tends to have a big impact on behavior. And the minute you make a big impact on something that's already partly optimized, you're likely to drop all the way back down to, to zero, right? Okay, so in morphological protection, we're going to see a particular evolutionary algorithm that is going to try and protect morphological innovations. When there's a change to the morphology, that particular lineage within the population, we'll talk about lineages in a moment, 
is going to be protected. It's going to have a, a, a few generations to prove that that morphological change is actually useful. If it doesn't, the lineage dies out. OK, so let's have a look at this idea. This work on morphological protection was actually carried out by um, Nick uh, Cheney. He actually took this course about three years ago, and I mentioned him at the beginning of the lecture. After graduating from UVM, he went to go work for NASA for a little while on their uh, Tensegrity robots. Um, and during that time, he developed this idea. I'm going to walk you through this. So uh, again, just to give you an idea, an intuition behind this, let's imagine we have the biped that you see here. The arrow is just a visual representation of its fitness. How far to the right does the robot get? Inside the robot is a neural network controller. Let's imagine this particular parent produces this child which lengthens the legs but does not change the controller, as you would imagine, fitness is going to drop to near zero. Whatever controller worked for the first body probably isn't going to work so well for the second body. So we're going to protect this morphology for a couple of generations. And if we're lucky, there will be subsequent control mutations represented by the red arrow there. So that's a change to a synaptic weight. Maybe there's multiple changes to multiple synaptic weights where eventually those control mutations demonstrate that this morphological change was a morphological innovation. If you're evolving bipedal locomotion, there is an advantage to having longer legs, generally speaking, right? But it takes a while to figure out how to orchestrate movement using those, those longer legs. So in a typical evolutionary algorithm, if this parent gave rise to this child, there'd be a good chance that this child would be killed and disappeared from the, disappear from the population before it had a chance to produce grandchildren to demonstrate the usefulness of this morphological change. Make sense? That's the innovation. I'm going to show you how we do this morphological protection. OK. In order to describe this, we're going to go, have to go back and revisit a few concepts we've already seen. The first one is MOO, multi-objective optimization. We've talked about this a few times before. You might have multiple things that you're trying to optimize in your fitness function. This goes all the way back to one of the reality gap lectures. So we can visualize multi-objective optimization by drawing the two fitness objectives. And then each dot becomes a single robot in the population. The position of that dot represents its value of objective one and its value of, of objective two. When we saw this before, we were trying to maximize objective one, how well things transferred from simulation to reality. And we were also trying to optimize or maximize objective two, how, uh, how good the behavior was. In multi-objective optimization, after we've evaluated each individual in the population, we go back and we're going to tag each individual in the population as either dominated or non-dominated. Thinking about dominated is a little bit easier. An individual in the population is dominated if there is another individual in the population that dominates it, and if another individual dominates it if it's better in terms of both objectives. So this individual is dominated by this individual. And if you remember, there's a typo here. This one is actually supposed to be non-dominated because there is no other point that is up and to the right of this point. Right? This individual is better in terms of behavior, but worse in terms of transferability. This individual is better in terms of transferability, but worse in terms of behavior. So in multi-objective optimization, we evaluate all the individuals. We tag the dominated and non-dominated solutions. We then, we, then delete, we then delete all of the dominated solutions, and we're left with individuals along this non-dominated front. And the survivors then produce offspring. And in some cases, one of them might produce an offspring that dominates an individual on the front. So that individual falls off the front and dies off. And if we continue multi-objective optimization in this example, that front will move for further and further up and to the right. That's multi-objective optimization. So far, so good? OK. So 
We're going to use multi-objective optimization in the ground floor of this algorithm we're developing today about morphological protection. So we're going to take multi-objective optimization, and we're going to embed multi-objective optimization in a new evolutionary algorithm. This is one you haven't seen before. Um, this is known as AFPO, or Age Fitness Pareto Optimization. This is a pretty high-powered evolutionary algorithm. This is the one that we use in all the experiments uh, in our group, and I'll show you why. You might have already realized that the parallel hill climber and the genetic algorithm have pros and cons. Neither is ideal. What's the problem with the genetic algorithm compared to the parallel hill climber? It's got an obvious problem. Most of you have probably seen it by now. It lacks diversity. It lacks diversity, right? You remember in a genetic algorithm that any individual in the population, the higher its fitness, the more children it can produce. So if a high fitness individual produces lots of children, those children are likely to have high fitness as well, and they're likely to produce lots of children. And within just two or three generations, you've driven all the other species, so to speak, to extinction, and you have one lineage in the population. So we've talked about individuals so far in a population. A lineage is somewhere in between. A lineage is a subset of individuals in the population that are all related. Right? So a genetic algorithm is not great because you lose diversity. It gets swamped by a single lineage. So some of you have discarded the genetic algorithm and gone back to the parallel hill climber, which is perfectly fine. But there's a problem with the parallel hill climber as well. What is it? You're all happy with the parallel hill climber? <laughs> Simple, that's, that's nice. You only have, I mean, you only have a population of one. It's just, just there's no diversity at all. There's no, well, there's maximum diversity in the sense that if you have 10 individuals, you have 10 lineages, right? Well, no one lineage yeah, okay. can drive another one out to extinction. So diversity is not the problem. What's the problem with the parallel hill climber? The, the rate of like a mutated individual being uh, evaluated with it, yeah, it's somehow kind of slow, right? And the reason why the parallel hill climber is slow is some of those lineages are unlucky, right? They start somewhere in the fitness landscape and they start on the slope of a very low hill, a local optima, right? So they might climb for a while and then they kind of get stuck there. If you go back and run your parallel hill climber and watch the columns of numbers, you'll see some of those columns remain at very low very low numbers, right? So there's certain lineages where you just kind of wish they disappear, right? You know they're stuck, they're never gonna make any more progress. It'd be great if one of the more successful lineages could kind of take over and have a little bit more room to maneuver. Is there an algorithm that does kind of both at once? Yes, this one, exactly. So the APO was introduced to try and deal with these sort of competing problems in these two different algorithms, right? We'd like to have diversity in the population, right? But we also don't want to spend too much computational effort on unlucky lineages. But if we let unlucky lineages die off, then maybe we lose diversity. Could we create an evolutionary algorithm where we maintain diversity, but also give more and more computational effort to the more successful lineages? And at least before AFPO was introduced, it sounded like an almost impossible task, but it turns out it's not. And so I'm gonna walk you through AFPO to show you how this works. So um, it's actually simple when you start to think about it. It uses, as you can see from this picture, multi-objective optimization. So like before, we're gonna have fitness on the vertical axis. I've written this as one over fitness, because this is gonna just help us when we think through this algorithm. Imagine we're trying to maximize fitness. So one over fitness means the lower the point, the lower the y value of the point, the better it is. So I'm just plotting four different points here. And so the, there is only one non-dominated solution in the population at this point, which is the green one. The other three are worse, have worse fitness. So far so good? Okay. The second objective here is going to be age, and it's not the age of the individual, it's the age of the lineage. And age in terms of when did the lineage get started. So what I'm showing you in this picture here, imagine we just have a population of four individuals. We created those four individuals at random, 
which means they're not related to one another. So we have a population size of four. We have four different lineages. And they all have an age of zero. They were All those lineages were just created this generation, the first generation. Okay. So they don't differ in terms of age. They only differ in terms of fitness. So there's this one non-dominated solution on uh, the front. We've evaluated everybody's fitness. We've tagged three of these individuals as dominated. One is non-dominated. What happens next? What do we do in multi-objective optimization before we move on to the next generation? We delete the dominated ones. We delete the dominated ones, and we're left with only one. So this one is going to produce some offspring. But before it does, we're going to assume that this is the end of the generation, and we're now starting the next generation. So we've evaluated everyone. We've tagged dominated, non-dominated. We've deleted. And everyone that survives, all the individuals that survive, we're going to age them by one generation. OK. So we've aged them by one generation, and now we produce new children. And to keep this super, super simple, I'm just showing one child here. This uh, one child, uh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. We age the individuals, and there's one additional new detail in AFPO, which is we're going to inject one new random lineage into the population. So we're going to take one individual, create it at random, inject it into the population, it's new, so it has an age of zero. As you would imagine, because it's random, it doesn't have very good fitness, so it ends up here. So at this point, there are two individuals, and neither, dom neither dominates the other one, so we have two non-dominated solutions. We have a population size of four. We had one survivor. We introduced someone new. So one way to think about AFPO is that there's an island. And on this island are a bunch of lineages, and they're all, all evolving. Every once in a while, an individual from some new lineage swims up onto the shore of the island and starts to compete with the lineages that were already there. In this case, it's this point. So we have one survivor, one new arrival, and we have two <clears throat> remaining empty slots. So we do what we always do in multi-objective optimization. We pick a non-dominated solution at random, and it produce, produces an offspring. Pick a new individual on the non-dominated front, produce an individual, and continue until you filled all the empty slots. In this cartoon, we have the new arrival produced one offspring, which is a little more fit than itself. This individual produces an offspring, and that offspring is less fit than the parent. And now we're back to four individuals in the population. Who lives and who dies now? The child of the new arrival and the parent from the original parent at age one. Close. I, I forgot to mention here, remember we're trying to minimize this objective. Right? We're trying to maximize fitness, so minimize this objective. And we're also going to select for individuals that have younger age. So this individual here is younger than this individual and has, uh, and has higher fitness. So this individual dominates this individual. So unlike the previous example where the front was pushing up and to the right, in this case we're trying to push down and to the left. We're trying to minimize both of these objectives. Is that what you said? I misunderstood what you said. My apologies. OK. So it's these two individuals that survive. Right? Question. Why are we selecting for younger age? I haven't told you why yet, just that we are. So that's a good question. Why are we selecting for younger age? Uh, because it's going to prevent um, individuals that have been evolving for longer from killing off genetic material or genetic innovation that exactly. hasn't had a chance to optimize yet. So by minimi selecting for minimal age, we're going to maintain diversity in the population. 
If I'm an old individual in the population, and because I'm old, I must have relatively good fitness to survive this long, I'm going to kill off any newcomers to the island immediately, right? Not unlike what happens in your genetic algorithm. So any other individuals in the population that have lower fitness than me, I can kill them off as long as they're the same age or older than me. So if we go back to the cartoon example here, this parent produced this child, and now this same sounds weird because they have the same age. Remember, they have the same age for their lineage. This parent can kill off this child. They have the same age. But this parent, uh, well, there's no example here to, for that, but I think you get the... I think you get the idea, right? So from time to time, you get lineages washing up on the shore of this hypothetical island. Um, they're young, but they have some potential. They have low fitness, but not non-zero fitness. They start to produce offspring, and that lineage as a whole ages over time. And eventually, that younger lineage might produce an individual that has better fitness than any individual in the population. And all the older lineages are driven to extinction. So this is like the parallel hill climber, where we're watching one lineage which is stuck on a local optima for a long time. And elsewhere in the population, on another hill, pop, uh, the lineage is climbing that hill, and that hill ends up being taller than the other hill. The individuals that are sitting, the lineage that's sitting on the lower hill, are, they die off. Right? Okay. So that deals with this issue of uh, wasting computational effort on individuals that are stuck on a small local optima. And it also helps maintain diversity because we're continuously introducing new genetic material, new lineages into the population that may eventually drive older lineages to extinction. So far, so good? OK, that's AFPO. Um, for those of you that are feeling, uh, sorry, then, and then we age, at this point we have two lineages, one individual from both lineages, we age both of those, inject a new individual, just washed up on the shore, and we continue this, this process. Okay, what tends to happen, here's a nice visualization if you plot fitness curves for, from AFPO, looks very different. The way to do this, and I'm sorry it's not showing up here on the projector, which is a shame, um, there are a whole bunch of very light colored lines underneath this plateau here. Each colored line represents the best individual from that lineage. So we have a green lineage here. This is the green dinosaurs, okay? They have pretty high fitness. There's a whole bunch of other dinosaurs down here that belong to the same lineage. And at this point in time, a single small mammal washes up on the shore of the hypothetical island. This young mammal has much lower fitness than the best dinosaur. But this mammal gradually evolves and eventually produces a red individual that has higher fitness than the dinosaurs. And unlike the real dinosaurs, in this case, the dinosaurs go extinct because of the mammals. The mammals continue to improve for a while, and then some new species arrives and eventually displaces it, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in AFPO, you get these nice evolutionary dynamics where you don't get this long plateau. You still get some plateaus, but eventually, if you keep running your algorithm, you'll get a new, better solution in the population. Some of you that have run your genetic algorithm or your parallel hill climber for 100 generations, you might have run it and seen no evolutionary improvement. AFPO helps with this problem for the reasons we just talked about. OK, if you're feeling ambitious, you might want to try and uh, implement AFPO. It's actually not too, too difficult. OK, so that's AFPO. We talked about multi-objective optimization. AFPO is a type of multi-objective optimization method. Morphological protection is going to take AFPO and make one small change, which is we're going to replace age with generations since last morphological mutation. So what does that mean? That means each individual in the population is obviously the result of a mutation. That mutation might have hit the child's morphology or its controller. If the mutation hit the child's morphology, that means there have been zero generations since that individual experienced a morphological mutation. 
If that individual produces a new child, that child suffers a control mutation, that grandchild has experienced one generation since the last morphological mutation. Make sense? Okay. We're going to try and minimize this objective like we did for age. Why? How does this protect morphological mutations? going to be the same as the age where you, know, you get a catastrophic decrease in fitness due to you know leg increase but then you give it some time some protected some time. time to catch up exactly so i might be an old i might be an old individual in this population old in the sense that i am the descendant of a lineage in which there has been a hundred control mutations since the morphological mutation so maybe my hundredth grandparent back experienced longer legs, and all my ancestors up until me have been control mutations on that longer-legged morphology. So my lineage has had a long time to try and find a compensating controller for that change to the morphology. Right? There's another individual that's appeared in the population that just suffered another mutation that produced even longer legs. It has an age of zero, because it has just experienced longer legs, it probably can't walk very far, and without morphological protection, I would immediately kill it off. But I can't because it has a younger age, so it has some time to catch up. The nice thing about morphological protection is the amount of time that that lineage has to catch up, we don't need to specify it. We don't need to introduce a parameter saying, okay, we're gonna give all robots five generations to catch up after a morphological change. It depends on what's going on in the population. Question. Doesn't it be bad that when you get to zero, doesn't that outperform the beginning? This one here? In this cartoon example, yes. So if this individual just suffered a morphological mutation gets an age of zero, and in this cartoon example here, not only did it get longer legs, but it also got better fitness than everyone in the population. You're golden, right? Everyone else dies off. That's typically not what happens, right? Usually these points are much higher. Okay, so let's again try and think about the intuition behind this. Let's imagine we have these three individuals in the population. Going back to the cartoon I showed you at the beginning of this lecture, let's imagine we have this robot in the population, and this individual has an age of zero, which means its grandparent suffered a morphological mutation, its parent suffered a control mutation, and it itself suffered a control mutation. It's two generations in from a morphological change. That's the current state, okay? That individual produces this child, and this child suffers a morphological mutation. The legs get longer, right? So the age of this child is now zero, right? It's got a good chance of being protected, and it should be protected because its fitness is much worse than its parent. Right? Okay, parent, child, grandchild, so this one is the descendant of this one. That, that's, that's the parent, that's the child, parent, child. The child here suffers a control mutation. So it's one generation in from a morphological mutation. And this control mutation has improved fitness relative to the parent. So in this case, that controller is sort of readapting to the change in the morphology, right? It's catching up. Now, Assuming this, pr this process continues, it might eventually displace this point altogether. Perhaps with enough control mutations, it'll figure out how to walk faster, given the fact that it has longer legs. Okay. Make sense? Okay, that's the morphological protection algorithm. Let's see how it does. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, we're going to apply this to uh, soft robots which you've already seen. You remember uh, Sam, the guest lecturer who was here, walked you through this idea. Uh, we've talked about this a few times now. We're going to use not PyroSim, but our soft, uh, our soft robot simulator, where the robots are made up of a bunch of these 3D pixels or voxels. 
These voxels have different properties. The red and the green ones are muscles. They expand and contract. Light blue voxels are passive and soft, so they're like fat. And dark blue voxels are passive and stiff, like bone. Right? So we're going to use an evolutionary algorithm that is going to create these phenotypes, and we're going to use morphological protection. You can probably imagine that any change to the body of these is pretty catastrophic, and we would like controllers to be able to catch up after any change in the body. Okay. That's the phenotype, these soft robots. If you remember back to Sam's guest lecture, what were the genotypes? What were used to construct these phenotypes? Talked about lots of different genotypes at this point. Vectors, matrices, trees. Anybody remember? I'll give you a hint. The genotype paints these colors onto these voxels. What paints? Also introduced a lot of acronyms in this class. Hyperneat, right? Exactly. So remember, hyperneat creates genotypes which are CPPNs, compositional pattern producing networks. Those CPPNs paint regular structure inside of some dimensional space. Did Sam show you this, this picture? Okay, so I'll walk you through this again. We have this empty cage to begin with, and we're going to visit each 3D position uh, in this cage where a voxel might be placed. When we visit any XYZ coordinate in this cage, we input that XYZ coordinate to this CPPM. There's one. Remember, we're always evolving populations of these CPPMs. There are two output neurons in these CPPMs. The first one is a binary output neuron, which produces a zero or one. If it outputs a zero when presented with that uh, position, it does not place a voxel there. If a 1 arrives at this output neuron, it does place a voxel there. So if we imagine just this one output neuron, we're going to scan through this empty cage and it's going to paint or inject voxels at different positions. Question? Um, but uh, this seems like all the colors sort of like uh, group together. Ah, uh, yeah. We, how do we ensure that all the colors are grouped together? I mean, I know that like in some of the other ones that you showed, they might have like some green here and some green there. That's right. But, you know, how did you choose it from just like putting one, one little spot with green and one little spot with green? Exactly. So if you'll remember back to our lecture about hyperneat, hyperneat was designed in order to not just paint uh, structure within a space, but to paint regular structure. So if you create a random CPPM, it tends to produce non-random patterns. You remember, if you remember back, I actually did it at the board where we had one CPPN with one X input neuron and a G output neuron, which was the amount of gray, which means basically as the X coordinate on the board becomes greater, as we move from the left to the right of the board, we paint more gray. You create a CPPN at random and it tends to produce regular patterns like gradients or groupings or repetition. That's where the grouping comes from. We don't force it to do it. We created an evolutionary algorithm, hyperneat, which does it for us. OK, so we do one pass through this empty cage, which places voxels. We go back and do a second pass with exactly the same input coordinates. And now we look at the second output neuron. And that second output neuron, we're going to clamp it down to an integer between 0 and 3, 0, 1, 2, or 3, which is which of the four material properties, or which of the four colors should you paint onto that voxel. So the CPPN determines the three-dimensional shape of the robot, and also its material properties. Which part of the body are muscle, which parts are bone, which parts are fat. Okay. There's, uh, the CPPN has no control over the controller, but only, well, it has control over it, but indirectly. You remember that I mentioned that the red and the green voxels are muscle groups. Each muscle group is controlled by a CPG. 
central pattern generator. Remember that central pattern generators are basically clocks. They output a sinusoidal pattern, and they cause the muscle to contract and expand. The red voxels listen to the red CPG, and the green voxels listen to a green CPG that ticks out of the two CPGs tick out of, out of phase with one another. So whenever red voxels contract, the green ones are expanding, and whenever the green ones are contracting, the red ones are expanding. So far, so good? Okay, so just we're going to start to put all these pieces together. We're going to evolve populations of CPPNs. They're going to create these robots. Question? Yeah, to be clear, are we, is this experiment just evolving locomotion? Uh, we're going to just evolve locomotion, yes. Yeah, so one, the one thing that isn't different in this experiment is the fitness function. As always, just locomotion. Okay, now I mentioned in morphological protection, we need to be able to distinguish between mutations that hit the controller and mutations that hit the morphology. A mutation that hits the CPPN is clearly going to change the morphology, but it can't change the controller because the controller is just the red CPG and the green CPG. So we're going to take this and we're now going to add in controllers to these robots. How do we do that? We're going to now encode in the genotype two CPPNs. The first one that we just talked about is going to paint or construct the morphology. It's going to paint where there are empty voxels or no voxels and where voxels exist. It's going to paint them just as active and passive. So we're going to throw away the four colors and we're just going to look at red muscle and uh, blue passive material, fat. In every genotype, there's going to be a second CPPN, which is now going to sweep over the body of the robot and paint a controller onto it. It's not going to paint a neural network controller. We're trying to keep this experiment as simple as possible. It's going to paint, for every muscle voxel, a frequency and a phase offset. So every single red voxel now has its own CPG, and different CPGs can beat at different frequencies and different phase offsets. Okay, so now we have a population of individuals. Each individual is made up of a pair of CPGs, and those pair of CPGs produce one phenotype, which is one of these soft robots. Now we can apply the morphological protection algorithm because we know that a mutation that hits the first CPPN in a genotype is going to change the body, but not change the CPGs. And a mutation that hits the second CPPN will not change the body of the robot, but it will change its controller. Yes? What are D and D as inputs? Uh, D is, I, I didn't mention that, D is actually the center of the distance from the center of the empty cage. So when we input the position inside this cage, we, we supply actually four input neurons, X, Y, Z, and D. The investigators included D because that helps with radial symmetry. You might want to create something that's round which means everything on the surface of that round individual has the same distance D from the center. It just helps produce certain, it biases evolution towards certain kinds of symmetry, like radial symmetry. So one, two, three, four inputs, and then there's a fifth input B. Anybody know what B is? We've introduced lots of different kinds of neurons in this class. It's the bias neuron, right? So it's a neuron that just always outputs one. That's what B is. Okay, so we're ready to put this all together now, right? We have a population of evolving CPPN pairs. Each CPPN pair produces one simulated soft robot, and we're going to use morphological protection. We're going to evolve around along two objectives, fitness and time since number of generations since the morphology CPPN was hit. So far, so good? Okay. Let's look at some results. These are results when we're using population of CPPN pairs, but instead of using morphological protection, if you look in the top right, we're just going to use AFPO. So we know whenever we use AFPO, we're going to get bunches of colored lines, each color 
Each color corresponds to one unique lineage. At the beginning, in the first hundred generations here, there was a lot of interesting evolutionary dynamics. New lineages were washing up on the shores of this hypo hypothetical uh, island, replacing older lineages. There was a lot of excitement for the first hundred generations, and then no more improvement was made. Uh, I mentioned this work was done by Nick. Nick was working at NASA. Uh, Nick got permission to use NASA's supercomputer, the Pleiades supercomputer. Used to be in the top 10 supercomputers in the world. I think it's been bumped out of the top 10, but it's still a pretty high-powered machine. He used a very large population, was able to evolve for 7,000 generations. He kept the Pleiades cluster uh, at NASA going for quite some time here. And don't tell NASA, but for 95% of that time, nothing very interesting was, was going on. Right? Okay, so uh, that's AFPO. One, this is one single evolutionary run with AFPO. I'm going to show you the exact same thing. So in the next experiment, everything is exactly the same, except we're going to replace age with number of generations since last morphological change. This happened. This time, we didn't waste NASA's time. OK. So you can see that even for this simple task of locomotion, there are new individuals that appear in the population, new lineages that have different shaped bodies. And their controllers don't work anymore because the body has changed. But if you give them a few generations, some of them never show any promise, right? They keep going. They get older and older and older. Lots and lots of control mutations uh, accumulate. Fitness doesn't go up, and they're eventually killed off by yet another younger lineage that's following uh, hot, on its, hot on its heels. But in a few cases, there are lineages in which there is a morphological change. So again, you can see now this picture cartoon that I showed you before is not actually a cartoon. It's real results. This lineage was eventually displaced by this lineage, and this different color tells us that Individuals in the blue lineage have a different body plan than individuals in the red lineage. Every individual in the red lineage, every red robot has exactly the same body, but they have different controllers. And every blue individual in the blue lineage has the same body also, but different controllers. So there's definitely an advantage to allowing evolution some time to readapt the controller to the morphology. Okay, we were pretty excited by this result. I, don't, I have never seen an evolutionary algorithm that runs for over 6,000 generations and is still making quite a bit of evolutionary improvement. So this is pretty exciting because it also, uh, it also addresses another open problem in the field, not just the field of evolutionary robotics, but the larger field of evolutionary algorithms in general, <clears throat> which is the idea of open-ended evolution. So as far as we know, in biology, if we let life continue to evolve on this planet, it'll keep producing more and more interesting lineages, right? Mother Nature doesn't tend, seem to run out of creative steam. The question has been for a long time in evolutionary algorithms, can we do the same thing? Here, we still have a relatively simple system compared to, actually, uh, to actual biological evolving populations. But even for the simple task of locomotion, it turns out that there are lots of different morphologies out there that, if coupled with the right controller, produce faster and faster locomotion. OK. Almost done with this, this lecture. Uh, two more slides to go. Let's have another look at the results. What do these robots actually look like? These are results that were evolved with AFPO. So we're going back to the control experiment, fitness and age. Each row, each row here corresponds to one single evolutionary run. Okay, So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 rows, 10 different evolutionary runs. Question? Ah, OK. I, I'm, so in this, in this slide here, color no longer represents bone or muscle. Color represents fitness. So the cooler the color, the slower the robot moved. Okay? So in this plot, we can see 10 different runs. 
The columns going from left to right represents evolutionary time, like we've seen before, going from the initial random populations up to 5,000 generations. If we look at just the top row here, this individual was the best robot in the initial random population. Ten generations later, this was the best robot in that population, and so on. So you can see here we have more or less the same shape, but the color is like getting a little bit warmer, which means these robots are getting a little bit faster. Okay, what can you tell me about what's, what's going on in AFPO when we apply it to these kinds of robots with this kind of fitness function? We already know evolution doesn't do very well. It runs out of gas, which is why we mostly see cool colors here. What else is happening? Bodies aren't really changing after 100 generations. The bodies aren't really changing, right? There's some body that appears early in evolutionary time towards the left of this figure, and it gets evolution gets stuck there, right? It's started to climb some peak, and it's able to make control improvements, slight control improvements to that morphology, but any new morphology which results because a mutation hits CPPN1, completely disrupts whatever slight improvement had been made, and because that new morphology is not protected, it's gone, right? Okay. So you can see there's very little morphological innovation going on in these populations. This is AFPO. This is morphological protection. What's happening now? So these are 10 runs using morphological protection. What's happening now? It's finding the same solution. It, it finds the same solution. This is another biological phenomenon um, that tends to reappear in evolutionary algorithms if done right, which is convergent, convergent evolution. We're starting from very different places in the fitness landscape starting very different places in the fitness landscape, but evolution is able to move long horizontal distances in the fitness landscape and eventually end up on the same peak. Remember, these are 10 separate runs. So it's not that somebody finds one of these solutions and broadcasts it or produces offspring. These are 10 different independent populations that all converge on the same solution, which suggests, at least given the amount of evolutionary effort we could do here, that this is maybe the best you can do given these kinds of robot bodies, this kind of simulator, this kind of fitness function, and so on. I'm, I, I don't have a video with me, but you can kind of figure out what these robots do. They have this sort of L shape, and because of their mass distribution, they fall forward, and then they do more or less what you were doing in assignments one, two, and three. They were scissoring forward, and because they're three-dimensional here, they tend not to tip over to the left or right. If all you have to do is locomote over flat ground, inchworm locomotion works perfectly fine. Yes? Yes, and um, for this algorithm, as it's working, it has, um, is it still just generating one new mutation of each um, or non-nominated uh, not necessarily. So remember that in multi-objective optimization, this is fine, in multi-objective optimization, you have survivors on the front, right? So we might have a population, I can't remember how big the population was in this case, probably a couple hundred. You tend to have, um, when you have two objectives, you tend to have a Pareto front with about, a uh, non-dominated front with about 10 or 12 individuals on it, right? With 10 or 12 individuals, which means all the other 190 die off, and now you just pick those survivors at random and produce an offspring. So typically the survivors on the front are producing 30, 40, 50 new individuals at a go. Okay, so that concludes lecture uh, 28 where we were looking at uh, dealing with this fact that it's actually hard to evolve morphology and control or it's hard for evolution to make progress when evolving morphology and control. We've come up with this algorithm that tends to help with that. And by doing so, it helps us to realize this long-standing goal of open-ended evolution. Uh, we'll leave things there for today. You have a quiz due tonight. And good luck with progress on your final project.